Well, welcome to this session on lessons from abroad for the U.S. entitlement debate. Uh, you all have uh, bios of the speakers, uh, so I won't provide introductions to people who need no introduction. Um, our first speaker is the author of the report that you should have in your package. Uh, really an excellent report. So Richard, why don't you go ahead? Very good. Thank you, Rudy. Um, you know, from the Congressional Budget Office and the Government Accountability Office to the Bowles Simp Simpson and uh, uh, Rivlin Domenici Commissions, everybody who's looked seriously at the fiscal arithmetic agrees that there's no solution to the long-term budget problem that doesn't include fundamental entitlement reform. I mean, after all, entitlements um, account for well over half of all federal spending today um, and for all projected, projected growth in non-interest outlays as a share of GDP over the next two or three decades. Um, demographers, economists, and policy experts have, of course, been warning for decades that the aging of America would eventually trigger an explosive rise in entitlement spending that pushes the federal budget toward a, a fiscal precipice. But two recent, or fairly recent, developments um, have now greatly increased the urgency of reform. Um, the first is the retirement of the baby boom generation. With the leading edge of this outsized generation now reaching old, old age, the long predicted cost spiral um, is finally upon us. Uh, the second development is the economic and financial crisis, which has driven the federal debt to unprecedented peacetime levels and essentially erased all fiscal room that the United States might otherwise have had to accommodate the projected growth in entitlement spending. So the, these two developments together have taken a long-term budget challenge and turned it into a near-term challenge as well. Now, as the United States grapples um, with entitlement reform, it will have much to learn from the experience of other developed countries, um, some of which have moved uh, much more deliberately than the United States has to control the long-term fiscal cost of their age waves. Several countries have enacted sweeping overhauls of their public pension systems designed to stabilize their cost as a share of GDP. Um, Italy and Sweden are transforming their traditional defined benefit um, systems into notional defined contribution systems um, uh, in which benefits are in effect indexed to the growth in the payroll tax base, uh, perhaps not directly, uh, but indirectly. Germany and Japan have introduced automatic demographic stabilizers into their pension si systems that achieve uh, much the same result by adjusting annual benefit payments to partially or fully offset the annual change in the dependency ratio of contributing um, um, workers uh, to retired beneficiaries. In many more countries, recent reforms have trimmed benefit formulas, raised retirement ages, um, um, and put in place new funded pension systems uh, that either supplement or even partially substitute for pay-as-you-go systems. Meanwhile, on the health benefit side, most developed countries um, have been more successful in the United States at imposing budget constraints that control or at least moderate the rate of spending growth. So our, our focus today um, will be on retirement policy. You know, it's sometimes argued that achieving so savings in Social Security uh, is, is, is unimportant or perhaps even unnecessary since most of the projected growth in the overall U.S. old age dependency burden is due to, due to growth in Medicare and Medicaid. Um, it's true uh, that achieving savings and health benefit programs must be a high priority uh, but I do not believe uh, that it follows that retirement reform can be neglected. 
Uh, federal cash benefits account for a large and rising share of total federal outlays, uh, cash benefits to the elderly, that is. Moreover, there's no guarantee that health care cost control efforts will be successful. Indeed, if the history of past efforts is any guide, it is likely that advances in medical technology and rising public expectations about care and cure uh, will interact with demographic aging to put relentless upward pressure on government budgets for decades to come. To the extent that health benefit spending proves difficult to control, reducing retirement spending becomes all the more important. From the viewpoint of the budget and the economy, what matters is the total resource burden of federal entitlement programs, not which federal agency uh, is spending the money. Now, uh, in the core uh, of the report that we released today, um, I look uh, in, in some detail um, at reform developments uh, in nine other uh, developed countries. Um, but I have uh, Edward Whitehouse here uh, and, and, and Jim Capretta, um, um, uh, who probably know a lot more about that than I do. Um, so I'm going to leave aside the nuts and the bolts uh, of retirement reform uh, in other countries and instead uh, take um, my, my remaining time to put the overall U.S. aging challenge in international perspective and hopefully, hopefully set up uh, uh, the, rest of the, the rest of the panel. You know, in some respects, um, the United States is remarkably well positioned to confront the global aging challenge. Yeah, we're aging, um, but we're now the youngest of the major developed countries, and thanks to our relatively high fertility rate and to substantial net immigration, um, we're projected to remain the youngest for the foreseeable future. The share of the U.S. population aged 60 and over, which is now 19 percent, um, will increase to 26 percent uh, or thereabouts by 2040, compared with 30 percent in France, 39 percent in Germany, uh, and 43 percent in Japan. Um, meanwhile, the U.S. median age will rise from 37 to 40, um, but Europe's will rise from 40 to 48, uh, and Japan's from 45 to 55. Uh, by the 2020s and 2030s, the United States will also be the only major developed economy that still has a growing working age population. So to, 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 put, it in, to put it in other words, um, w w when the last of my troublesome baby boom generation is passed on to that great Woodstock in the sky, right, we'll be about as old as Japan and Italy are today. Um, we're not only due to age less uh, than other developed countries, um, we also have um, a less expansive uh, welfare state and less expensive old age benefit systems. Um, the U.S. cost advantage in public pensions is especially striking. Uh, according to CSIS projections, I, sh I should say, according to projections I've prepared while at CSIS, uh, these are published in my Global Aging Preparedness Index. Um, seven of the other nine countries included in the report will be spending a larger share of their GDPs on public pensions in 2040 uh, than the United States will, and three of them, France, Germany, and Italy, will be spending twice as much. Um, only Australia and Canada will be spending less. Now, to be sure, Social Security is seriously uh, underfunded, with, with earmarked tax revenues projected by um, 2040 to be sufficient to cover uh, only about four-fifths of, of, of benefits. Nonetheless, the overall cost of the program um, is not uh, especially onerous uh, by developed world standards. Um, if we instead look at total government benefits to the elderly, including health benefits, the U.S. cost advantage obviously narrows cons considerably. Yet at 18.5 percent of GDP in 2040, 
the total U.S. Uh, public old age dependency burden is still um, projected to be lower than that of any of the other countries in the report, except once again, Australia and Canada. Now, you might suppose, you might suppose uh, that less generous old age benefits um, would translate into a relatively lower living standard for the elderly. But in fact, um, uh, properly measured, uh, the income of the U.S. elderly compares quite favorably with that of the non-elderly. Uh, in 2010, the ratio of median after-tax elderly to non-elderly income, uh, note after-tax, uh, was about 1.3 to 1 in the United States, actually higher than in any of the other nine countries. Now, this doesn't mean that all of the elderly are well off. Um, uh, compared with most European countries, uh, the United States has both a much higher level of income inequality um, and a less generous uh, uh, means-tested safety net. Um, the share of the U.S. elderly with an income beneath 50 percent of the median income uh, for all persons, a standard uh, uh, relative poverty threshold in international comparisons, uh, uh, was 18 percent in 2010, which is, in which is higher than any of the other countries uh, covered in the report except Australia uh, and Japan. Um, still, despite America's less expensive welfare state, um, the living standard of the typical elder uh, is surprisingly high. Now, this apparent paradox um, has, a, has a number of explanations. Uh, I, I highlight two of them. Uh, the first is our well-developed funded pension system, um, which despite uh, large gaps in coverage helps to lift elderly living standards while taking pressure off of public budgets. Um, all told, funded pension benefits, including both benefits from employer plans and from personal plans like IRAs, uh, make up about 30 percent of the income uh, of the median income elderly uh, uh, in the United States, uh, which is a larger share than in any of the other countries except Canada. Um, in the large economies of continental Europe, funded pension benefits as a share of elderly income uh, are trivial, just 5 percent in Germany and just 1 percent uh, uh, in, in, in France. So there's, there's funded pension income. Um, there's also our relatively high rate of elderly labor force uh, participation. Um, in 2010, 39 uh, percent of adults aged 60 to 74 uh, were in the labor force, twice the participation rate uh, for the same age group in Germany, and four times the rate for the same age group in France and Italy. So we don't have a problem. Well, there, there had to be a second part to the presentation. Um, there had to be the but. Um, Despite its many advantages, uh, the United States faces, in fact, faces a challenge that may be every bit as daunting as those facing countries um, that are aging much more rapidly and have much more expansive welfare states. Uh, the projected level uh, of, of spending on old age benefits in the United States may not be particularly high, but the projected growth in benefits is very high indeed. Uh, uh, in our projections, uh, uh, which, which I think are, are, are roughly the same as CBOs, 7.4 percent of GDP from 2010 to 2040, um, uh, higher than in any of the other countries except uh, the Netherlands. Um, now, the level of old age benefit spending is, is clearly the most direct measure of the resource burden of population aging, uh, but the growth in that spending may be just as important. After all, some societies may be institutionally and culturally better equipped to manage uh, uh, a rising old age dependency burden than others. You know, in a country like the United States, um, with its tradition of limited government, um, may find that the road ahead uh, is, is just as bumpy uh, as for many countries that are projected to spend much more. I think I skipped one too many. Um, so 
what accounts for the rapid growth? Well, mainly, mainly two things. Uh, the first, um, first, it's partly attributable to America's unusually large baby boom. Although the United States is due to age less than most developed countries, the upward shift in its age structure will occur very rapidly. Um, if you look at the elder share of the population in 2040, we're at the low end. If you look at the projected growth rate and the number of people age 65 and over, we're at the high end. Um, you know, as it's passed through youth uh, and, and middle age, the baby booms temporarily slowed the aging of the population. If, if, if you look at, you know, either the metric of age, the age dependency ratio or the elderly share of the population. Um, but now with its leading edge craft crossing the threshold of old age, it's going to accelerate uh, the aging of the population. Um, between 2010 and 2040, the number of Americans age 60 and over will grow at the average annual rate of 1.9%. Um, that's higher than anywhere else except Canada and Australia, which also had unusually large post-war baby booms. Um, according to the Congressional Budget Office, the resulting surge in the number of beneficiaries will, count for, will account for all growth in Social Security retirement benefits and more than half the combined growth in Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid benefits. So the demographics, um, before we even get to the second point, which is excess cost growth, um, are a big driver uh, of, of spending. Now, of course, as we all know, the United States also um, has an exceptionally rapid rate of growth in, in, in health care spending, um, um, which acts as a multiplier uh, uh, on, on, on the growth in the number of beneficiaries. Uh, over the next uh, 25 years, uh, real age adjusted uh, public health care spending per capita, I'm sorry, over the past 25 years, it's grown at 4.1% in the United States. Um, in none of the other countries did this growth exceed 3%, and in Canada, Germany, Italy, and Sweden, it was less than, than 2%. Um, the greater success of other countries, uh, and, and, and perhaps we can get to some of the questions surrounding why they've had more success uh, in the discussion, um, but that's relatively well known. Um, what's less appreciated, uh, uh, certainly by U.S. audiences, um, is that many of these same countries have also been more successful at limiting the growth in retirement benefits. Uh, faced with projections showing that the aging of their populations would put relentless upward pressure on public pension spending, um, a number of countries have enacted very uh, significant redu reductions in the future generosity uh, uh, of, these, of these systems. Um, compared with a hypothetical current deal scenario um, in which today's average replacement rates and average retirement ages remain unchanged, the total cost um, of, of uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the total cost of pension benefits in the current deal relative to current law in the United States is cut by about uh, one fifth. Um, in in Canada and France, uh, it's cut by about one third, and in Germany and Japan. Um, by two-fifths, and in Italy by nearly one-half. Um, we'll hear about, uh, more about why um, from, the other, from the other panelists. So in the end, uh, and, and, and let me just wrap up quickly with a few thoughts, we're, we're, we're left with an apparent paradox. Um, here, you have, uh, he, here you have a bunch of other developed countries, um, many of whom uh, have very large, expensive welfare states that have historically proven resistant to cost containment um, and, 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 and to reform. And, and yet these countries uh, have been able to move more aggressively to address their long-term uh, uh, aging challenge and uh, fiscal uh, challenge than the United States has. Um, as you can see in the chart, uh, retirees in much of Europe receive almost all of their personal income from public pensions, which are considered the cornerstone of social democracy. Um, 
So why have these other countries been able to enact reform uh, when we haven't? I think part of the explanation um, is, is probably that until recently, the age wave in the United States loomed well over the horizon, um, while aging populations uh, have been pushing up payroll tax rates and slowing economic growth in Japan and Europe for decades. Um, part may have to do with our uh, 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 seeming ability uh, uh, to borrow without limit, um, due in part to the, the dollar status as global reserve currency. That there's a great uh, advantage uh, that comes with that, um, um, but also uh, a great risk, because it lulls us into a sense of invulnerability. Um, part of the explanation, I think, lies in America's peculiar entitlement ethos. You know, in Europe, government benefit programs may be fiercely defended, and even at the barricades. Um, but, but in the end, everybody understands that government benefit programs are part of a social contract. Um, um, and, and that this social contract is subject to renegotiation and revision. Uh, in the United States, uh, we have uh, much, much of the public seems uh, to view Social Security and, and, and particularly Social Security, but also Medicare, as a kind of quasi-contractual relationship between the individual um, and, and, and the state. And this mindset, which is encouraged by the misleading insurance metaphors in which these programs are cloaked, um, may make old age benefits paradoxically more difficult uh, to reform in the United States uh, than in Europe's um, quote unquote bloated welfare states. Now, it, it, it may be that some of the progress other countries have made is more apparent than real. I mean, after all, there are two ways you can look at the difference between the current deal and the current law projection. One is that some countries have made a lot of progress in reducing the long-term cost of their old age benefit systems. And the other is that these countries have a lot of benefit cutting they're going to have to do over the next couple decades, just so things don't end up more expensive than the projections actually show. Um, but still, no matter how you, you, you slice it, I, I think there's no denying uh, that other countries have addressed the challenge with greater serious than the United, seriousness than the United States, at, at, at least to date. Um, and significantly, the impetus for reform has been as likely to come from the left as the right. Uh, reforms have sometimes been reversed when the party in power has changed. Uh, this happened in the UK. But more often than not, um, um, countries have been able to achieve a broad consensus across the political spectrum. Uh, part of that's due to uh, great attention to coalition building, but, but I think it also points to a, uh, uh, to a deeper uh, uh, truth. Um, uh, political leaders in other countries and many other countries seem to have grasped something that, that eludes uh, leaders in the United States. And, and that's that the unchecked growth in old age benefit spending threatens the agendas of both left and right. Um, it is inimical to limited government, but it's also inimical to progressive government. So let me end there. Sorry for running a few minutes over, Rudy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Richard. Our next speaker is uh, Edward Whitehouse. Um, thank you very much, and thank you, Richard. That was a very um, interesting overview of um, those, those countries. That was very, very useful. I think um, coming from the outside, the thing that um, always strikes me about the United States is how very little pension reform there has been. It is really only in the early 80s was the last major change, apart from a few adjustments to the incentives to keep working longer um, under the Clinton administration, very little has been touched. That, as Richard um, rightly emphasized, is not true of the other industrialized countries, where not only have there been um, at least one major pension reform, but there have often been a whole series of them. So pension reform in Italy, for example, is probably more of a process than a, than a one-off event. There have been um, at least three major changes in the, in the last 20 years, um, which makes my job of trying to monitor the pension systems of the 34 countries that are members of the OECD quite a tricky one um, to, to keep um, up to speed. But there have been major reforms. I think the, the sorts of numbers that Richard was showing there in terms of how much they will reduce benefits for future retirees are, are 
chime very closely with the analysis that, that, that we have carried out. So significant reforms, significantly lower benefits. Um, it's also interesting that, that basically all OECD countries are now increasing pension ages. And um, there was only a few who were saying 67. Um, even a decade ago, the, there will probably be around eight countries were heading towards 67. Now more than half of the OECD countries, 18 countries, are going beyond 65, and there will be no country in the long term with a normal pension age below 65. In some countries, um, Italy and Greece, for example, the pension age is going up to 67, and then will be linked to life expectancy. So for someone starting work today in um, Italy and in Denmark, I would estimate that they're normal pension age will be about 69. Um, the UK and Ireland are taking pension ages to 68, so it looks to me like 67 is not going to be the limit, and countries will be taking pension ages higher than that. Um, what, in, in terms of um, encouraging people to work longer, um, changes in pension age alone are, are often sh shown not to be sufficient. Uh, you need to look at the whole structure of the, uh, of the incentives for people to um, work and retire at particular ages. Most countries have now fixed what used to be very strong incentives to retire as soon as you possibly could. Um, there are very, very few countries now which still have um, systems in place which encourage people to retire earlier, and the secular decline in ret actual ages at which people stop working has reversed now. And in some countries, Germany will be one example, there have been a significant reversal of um, a, a move to early retirement and, and a very great increase in the proportion of 60 to 65 year olds who are working. Um, in my own country, the U UK, um, the fastest growing segment of the population in employment are over 65 year olds. Um, and uh, the normal pension age being 65 at the moment for um, um, for men and sl uh, slightly lower, lower than that for women. So there's a significant amount of people now working after the normal pension ages. That is a trend that, that I think will continue um, and public policy across the board needs to, to allow to support people having longer working lives. I, I just wanted to echo Richard's point about the, the, the relatively benign um, um, financial projections there are for the United States, and that's echoed in our, our own um, figures and research that um, currently the US spends around 4.5% of GDP on pensions. The OECD average is 9.5%, so significantly more. In the long term, um, we project that it will be roughly constant for, for the United States, and the OECD goes up from 9.5% to, to nearly 12% of GDP. So there, are, there is still a significant fiscal pressure from population aging in, in countries um, in Europe and in Japan and so on. Um, but those increases, um, as Richard had pointed out, would be much greater if we just allowed the demographics to, to play through um, into the longer term. Overall, on the generosity, um, roughly speaking, a, a median earner can expect a replacement rate, that is the pension relative to their earnings, of around 60% in the United States. It's about 70% on average in the OECD, so, so, so slightly um, less generous. At the lower end, because of the redistributive nature of the um, social security formula, giving you a 90% replacement on the first slice of your earnings, um, roughly, for a, for a low earner, roughly a replacement rate of about 70%, both in, in um, uh, the United States and in the rest of the OECD. So, so the um, social security in the United States is not um, a, a, an extremely small program. There are, there are other countries with, with less generous um, schemes in place. Um, quite, quite right to point out on the, on the um, poverty numbers, that is a, is a concern that something like one-fifth of um, older people in the United States are living in poverty, defined as having incomes of less than half the median. Um, that compares with only about 12% for the rest of the OECD. And I think that's something that um, needs addressing is the, uh, the strength of that safety net. Supplemental security income is only, is only claimed by a very, very small um, proportion of people. 
Um, I suspect that there are some people who are put off claiming that by the, by the complexity of, of, of claiming it. And the rules the, in, the, in terms of the means test of that are very, very tight. Basically, if you own anything, you are excluded from it. So um, one way of getting more bang for your buck is to have a system which targets the help on those most in need. That's one way of, um, of, of keeping, the, keeping the costs down. And I think looking at the area of SSI in the United States would be, would be a, a priority for, for me. I was asked by Richard to, to mention the kinds of reformers that have introduced some sort of automatic stabilizers into the pension system. And um, I have um, some specific country examples, some of which were included in, the, in, the, in his Richard uh, survey. Sweden, Poland, Latvia, and Italy have introduced um, notional accounts. Um, Notional accounts are notional in the sense that there is no money in them, um, but it is a mechanism for accounting and building up your, uh, your um, pension rights. The important part of that pension calculation is that there is an annuity factor in that calculation. So as life expectancy grows over time, benefits are automatically cut, reflecting how, how much life expectancy is, is, is changing. And that's um, th those countries that I mentioned. But other countries, so say Germany or Finland or Portugal, have a more standard type of pension scheme that will be more familiar to you, a defined benefit type of um, state pension scheme. And in Portugal, Finland, um, again, benefits automatically go down proportionately as life expectancy goes up. And in both cases, the first reductions in benefits as a result of those formulae have been put in place. As I mentioned before, Greece, Denmark, and Italy are linking the pension age to life expectancy, so there will be um, uh, continued increases in pension age. The Czech Republic has passed a law which says the pension age goes up by two months a year, and they have put no end on that, so you know it could be um, 100 in, in, a, in a couple of centuries' time, but there is no, there is no, no, no limit on that. Um, my concern about these stabilizing me mechanisms is that you're still cutting benefits, and that's fine if your starting point is Sweden or Italy where your benefits are high, but it is not fine if you are starting from the situation of, say, the United Kingdom or even the United States where the benefits are much more modest. It seems to me um, in those cases linking the pension age to life expectancy makes much more sense. Um, you can't start shaving bits off um, or, um, what are already relatively low benefits. One more direction of reform um, has been the introduction of greater amounts of pre-funding in pension systems. It um, started off in Chile and, and went through Latin America, and then it's gone through the um, Eastern Europe, Central Asia region as well. Some of these reforms have, have subsequently been reversed in Hungary and most recently in Poland. But it does mean that they are still in place in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Bulgaria, Romania, um, Slovak Republic, and so on. So that um, a, a introduction of mandatory defined contribution funded pensions has happened in those countries. Also, it was made mandatory in Australia in the, in the 1990s and more recently in Norway. So that is. Um, one particular trend. I think of, of, of in interest um, to, a, to a US audience is the um, automatic enrollment schemes of New Zealand and now the United Kingdom. So these are defined contribution pensions and you are automatically enrolled in them unless you sign a piece of paper saying I don't want to, to, be, to be in this. Um, in, um, it's being rolled out slowly in the UK, so it's, and, and the contribution rates are currently quite low, so it's difficult to come to any long-term judgment about what that has done. But in the past, there has been a significant decline in the proportion of the workforce covered by workplace pensions. It has gone down quite dramatically, about three million fewer people in the UK in company-provided pension schemes than there were a decade ago. And so that this, this reform is designed, it is hoped, to reverse that and to to, to use people's inertia to get them, turn the, these reluctant people into, into retirement savers. Um, in New Zealand, the, um, th there's certainly a lot of people have been automatically enrolled, but a lot of people have actually chosen to join them. So it's a difficult to say whether the New Zealand experience would carry over either to the United Kingdom or to the United States. 
um, because New Zealand in the 1980s abolished all tax privilege savings. And they went from having half of the workforce in company pensions to zero um, in, uh, practically overnight by, by doing that. So when they came along and said, right, there's this thing called KiwiSaver, and, and it is tax privileged, and there is nothing else tax privileged out there, a hell of a lot of people are going to go into that, not because they're being auto-enrolled, but because of the size of the tax incentives. And I think um, the balance between auto-enrollment and tax incentives is a, is a significant one, and one that per perhaps there can be some lessons um, loan for the US. Germany has introduced a thing called the Riester pension, named after, I think, the chap who um, designed the program. And that, uh, in the space of five years, got to about 60% of the workforce. So it went from zero to 60% of the workforce in, in, a, in a very, very short period. There is a concern with that. The contribution rate's quite low. I think the maximum is about 4%. And the government's putting in a hell of a lot of the money. And so it, it, it's... It's got to the point where the tax incentive is, is actually noticeable cost to the government, and there are, there are some significant concerns about both that and in New Zealand. Roughly speaking, 45% of the money in KiwiSaver and in Riester pensions came from the government, and so there is, a, is that a sensible use of government, um, government money. Um, I think there, um, I'll, I'll draw to a close. I'm, I'm, I hope I've um, given an, an overview of as many countries as I could uh, think of. <laughs> um, and I'd be happy to ask, um, um, uh, answer any questions you have about other countries as well, but I'll draw to a close there. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was very interesting. And um, I just would uh, want to also sort of urge everyone to read the Richard's report, which has quite a bit more in it than what he presented in his uh, in his opening remarks, it does cover quite a bit about uh, the, the international experience, and I found it very useful for triggering some thoughts about, about how to think about the U.S. reform debate here, which is what he asked, asked me to take a look at it in particular. Um, now, the, uh, as Edward has already gone over, there are some themes that one can pull out of the, the uh, and you can tell from his comments, as also Richard's comments, some themes that show up when you look around the world at what they've what they've done, and, and I, I, of course, agree very much with the, the uh, point that's been made, which is that it's remarkable how much has happened around the world, uh, number one. Number two, how much uh, hasn't happened here in the United States. And number three, how much the United States doesn't know what's happened around the world. <laughs> so, so it's quite a remarkable uh, turn of events where there's a lot of people here in the United States where I think are still in a basically a 1980s mindset where they think essentially the European welfare state is sort of in a, in a, in a state of disarray and hasn't really changed much. Now, there's some truth to that to some degree when you dig underneath the surface, but it's really remarkable how much political action has been taken, some of it quite risky politically, to make massive, massive changes in their pension systems. And some of the themes that come out of that are, are what I want to focus on here and what they might mean here for the United States. The first is this business of automatic stabilization. And, um, you know, the, the, what, what is to commend this, uh, you know, especially in the U.S. context, uh, the great thing about automatic stabilization is you take your pain one time, uh, presumably. Uh, that if you do it right, you design something properly, uh, you can insert into your, your structure something that can bring about a, a level of stability to your pension system commensurate with your dem demographic experience. I mean, the truth is, for a pension system, you cannot run it s long, or you can for a while, I mean, long is, a, is an interesting term in the pension world, but you can run it for a while uh, uh, in a way that's inconsistent with the demographic reality, but at some point, you know, it does, a collision point will come. And so you, you always will have to adjust your, your, your pension system to demographic reality. This is a question of, of when and how you do that. And What's, what these automatic stabilizers have to commend them is that someone has thought through to some degree, and they're relative, they're not all the same, and they have strengths and weaknesses, but someone has tried to think through in their own political context how to insert into their pension structure something that, that allows the political system to say, this should be self-correcting over time, commence with whatever happens. 
demographically. If we live longer, if we have uh, you know, shifts in our birth rate up or down, uh, you might be able to self-correct your pension system without large-scale political turmoil every 15 or 20 years. Now, Italy is a special case. They enjoy political turmoil. <laughs> and so they have an automatic stabilizer, but they revisit it all the time anyway. So, but, you know, it's not necessarily true that, that we would have to do that here. Obviously, here in the United States, we do not like to revisit Social Security. Uh, if you think about the life of Social Security, uh, it was enacted in 1935. Many, many changes occurred between 1935 and 1983. And then in 83, they tried to build into it some degree of more stabilization, not quite the same character as what they did in Europe or in elsewhere around the world, but, uh, and have essentially, as Edward noted, left it alone ever since. Pretty remarkable long period of time uh, when there's been massive demographic change and nothing essentially has changed in Social Security. And so um, I, I think it probably is time for the United States to start thinking about what can be done here to make this uh, uh, issue more self-correcting over time. And the themes, of course, are that there is demographic adjustments that automatically occur, particularly around uh, how long people are expected to be on the benefit program, longevity. But also, to some degree, uh, certainly in Sweden and in Germany, there's a corrective for the relative size of the retirement population to the uh, uh, working population that is supporting it and will eventually become retired. What's interesting about the Swedish reform is it tries to build all of that into a very complex and interesting formula that self-corrects over many generations. So that, that's one element to it. But there's also a rate of return aspect, sort of uh, what can be uh, allowed as a rate of return on contributions based on both the demographic as well as real economic growth reality of the country. Uh, that is implicit in the Italian scheme and also in the uh, Swedish scheme. And so those uh, are interesting things because, of course, those, those are the, that, that's the elements of a pension system, you know? Who's working, who's retired, and how much is the rate of return? If you figure those out, you've got the basics of how much you can pay. And so if you build them in automatically, perhaps you don't have to revisit it in a traumatic political sense every five or 10 or 15 years. The other major theme that's there is, and by the way, I would just say that Richard outlined this and explained this quite well in, in the report, as I indicated earlier. Uh, the second theme that comes out of the countries that are surveyed and other countries is transparent and positive labor supply incentives, that this whole business of notional accounts is in part designed to signal to the workforce, the more you work, the more retirement income you'll have. And in many defined benefit pension plans, that is not the case. Certainly in Social Security here in the United States, it is demonstrably not the case because you have a certain number of high retirement earnings years that are counted and other years are not. And once you get past a certain point, it's very difficult to change the basic size of your pension formula uh, by working more. So. Uh, uh, that is a big part of it. The more you work, the more your notional account grows, the more you'll earn in retirement. Uh, and then uh, the third element, obviously, is to try to incent and build and allow uh, the promotion of widespread, private, kind of, <laughs> fully funded retirement savings. Some are private, but encouraged by the government or forced by the government. Um, and, you know, in the United States, it's a different context. We have a very large, robust liquid. It's sort of the envy of a lot of People really, we have a very large scale, privately funded retirement system, fully funded retirement system. Um, the question is how to, how to make it more widespread and accessible in the United States to, to populations that are left out. But sort of mandating, it would be very difficult here in this country to mandate a new system on top of Social Security because we already have a very large scale participation in a private system today. Uh, now. Uh, specifically in the U.S. Social Security context, what are the, the features we're grappling with? Obviously, we have a pay-as-you-go system. That's similar to most of these other countries. So we're facing the same demographic and economic forces that forced reform around the world. Uh, it's a divine benefit program, Social Security, with large-scale redistribution. Uh, as Edward alluded to, it has this very uh, opaque benefit formula that provides a very large rate of return on your, the first tranche of retirement earnings, 90%. And then the second tranche is 32. And then the highest earning tranche is 15, but only earnings below the uh, taxable wage cap 
a little over $100,000 today, are counted toward this. So it's a very complex formula that is opaque to most of the public, and they, they really have no idea for a marginal dollar how much they're earning on their Social Security benefit. Um, notional accounts is intended to really address this idea, right? The idea is the more you earn, uh, each dollar earned is equal in terms of the value it's going to provide to you in retirement in that year, okay? So it, it uh, allows a very strong signal to both the working age population as well as those who are near to retirement to keep working as long as they can because well, their retirement benefit could go up. Um, but I can't un you, can't, you shouldn't <coughs> underestimate the importance of the fact that we have an uh, incumbent defined benefit program uh, that is very difficult to, it's hard to imagine displacing it easily because of the distribution. You're, dis you're redistributing between high and low wage workers. There's also other movements of money between single earners to couples, and then, you know, there's also other social welfare benefits built into Social Security. There are, there are family benefits that are included here and survivor benefits. So it's a complex situation to move from this defined benefit structure to a, uh, a notional account type structure. And moreover, you, you, uh, uh, in, in doing that, you probably would have to add a third element to the program to make it work which would be politically difficult too, which is to have at least some kind of generous flat benefit. Edward alluded to our SSI program. Uh, uh, SSI, Supplemental Security Income, is a, could conceivably be a flat benefit program in the United States if it was ramped up maybe almost double in size to its current program. Uh, but it's hard to see how that could happen politically too because that carries with it quite a bit of expense. You'd have to couple it with a large scale Social Security reform where there was <coughs> substantial downsizing of those costs. Uh, so I do think that there is a large political obstacle to, to you know, just saying let's move to the, in the United States toward notional accounts. Um, but that doesn't mean that some of these lessons still can't be applied in, a, in, a, in, in their own way. Uh, a few years ago, our distinguished moderator and uh, one of his colleagues also in the audience here, Gene Sterling, had written a report about automatic stabilizers. And they proposed... Uh, to put, insert into Social Security uh, essentially longevity indexing by administrative uh, discretion. That is, instead of trying to figure out uh, through the legislative congressional process every 10, 15, now 30 years, what should be the right early and, and normal retirement ages for the Social Security program, why not just hand off that authority to an administrative body with expertise for measuring that on an ongoing basis and adjust it accordingly, you know, every five or 10 years? Uh, to me, that's, that sort of makes a lot of sense. It's a technical, technocratic thing, and it's not necessarily something that does need to be inside a legislative decision-making process where it becomes so politicized. Because the truth is, you should be, uh, each generation should be treated fairly in terms of how much uh, retirement benefits are, the, are provided based on the tax rate and how much people are expected to live. It only makes sense you're going to have to make this adjustment, as Edward indicated, these other countries are, in fact, passing us now on moving beyond 67. Uh, now, uh, the next idea that could be, could be considered is something that would be borrowed essentially from Germany. Uh, uh, they built into their uh, formula an automatic uh, uh, benefit stabilizer uh, based on the ratio of the uh, elderly to, the, to the, the retiree population to the workforce. And if it moves away from a baseline projection by uh, some degree, then they automatically start uh, lessening uh, the benefits, and it's an across-the-board cut. I agree quite right, very much with Edward, that that would be a difficult proposition to just enact and start cutting things across the board here. However, I do think you might be able to look at something like this as a way of measuring the uh, amount of uh, benefits that are provided to newly retired people as they go into the uh, a retirement program. And you don't necessarily have to cut everybody who's on the existing program, but you might need to look at where we are demographically at a 5, 10, 15 year interval and say, for new cohorts of retirees, this kind of measurement will affect their, essentially, their annuity that's allowed to be paid over their lifetime. Uh, the third idea might be to eliminate the uh, payroll tax post age 62 or perhaps higher, 65. Uh, for most people, they're still paying both their Social Security and Medicare payroll taxes and they are paying, on any earnings, uh, even when they reach these ages where uh, um, those earnings provide very, very little rate of return for their retirement benefit. Certainly in Medicare, it provides essentially no benefit. 
So it's a large drag on the incentive to work uh, for the post-age 60 population. One idea would be say, let's just waive that entirely, unless it's a really meaningful contribution where the worker wants it to count toward their benefit, uh, it might be an idea to get rid of it. Uh, the fourth idea is to uh, get to this business of non-participation in fully funded retirement in the United States. There is some large-scale participation in the United States, but a segment is still left out. To reach that hard-to-reach population, you could set up something like what we have for federal retirees here, a thrift savings-like program for people to participate in uh, on a voluntary basis. I'm not, I'm not always in the nudge base, you know, nudge, nudge people in uh, automatic enroll, but I'm cer certain that some people would propose that in this context. Uh, but it certainly would provide a low administrative cost, um, safe investment vehicle for people to get into the 401k world who perhaps aren't in it today. And then, you know, as a more radical idea, why not allow notional uh, defined contributions for new entrants into the system? Perhaps move toward a system where they do look a little bit more like something as Sweden has tried to do. They'd, their pay-as-you-go contributions would still cover current costs. This is a way of bringing some more individualization into the system uh, without moving toward fully funded individual accounts inside Social Security. And you might be able to make it an election at age 25 or 30, whether someone would want to and take their retirement that way or not. Uh, I'll go very quickly through this because I don't, I, I think I'm over my time and Rudy's being generous. Uh, we, got, we got a little bit more. Medicare deserves five minutes. Okay, I'll, I'll go through Medicare very quickly. <laughs> I'm sorry to run over a little bit. Um, so, uh, you know, trying to think about Medicare, it's obviously a totally different uh, discussion. Medicare is a health benefits program, health insurance program, so it's not really the same, but it's a program that's unusual, in, you know, in the context around the world because most countries don't have a benefit program for health insurance just for their elderly. They have a national insurance program that their entire population participates in, whether they're working or retired. And so this is a little bit unique. And so what, one way to think about Medicare is sort of step back from its day-to-day -day operation and say, what is it really trying to do? And essentially what it's trying to do is say here in the United States, we're going to put everybody age 65 and older into the same insurance pool and it's guaranteed issue community rate insurance. That is, you, you get it whether you're sick or not, and um, it's the same premium for everybody, regardless of your health status, okay? So that's a huge value, okay? But no money needs to transfer between one pocket and another for that to happen. In other words, that huge value that's delivered to the elderly is just the fact that it's saying, here's insurance for you, guaranteed issue community rated. Now, let's talk about the premium. And Medicare adds to this community-rated uh, insurance product the fact that it's going to essentially have a social insurance pro uh, scheme set up to partially pay your premiums for you when you reach that point in time. Now, uh, it's this issue, the partial payment of the premiums, that could be rethought. That you could say, instead of it being uh, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the way it is now, a sort of a defined benefit approach to calculating how much that premium payment is from the government, it could be more like a defined contribution, almost like an add-on to your Social Security benefit. And, and if you start to think about it in those kinds of terms, one can then start to think about applying these lessons from pension reform also to the Medicare construct. That is, perhaps one starts to think about this contribution you're going to get from the government towards your pension or toward your premium payments in Medicare, almost like an annuity that needs to be adjusted for longevity, as well as perhaps other demographic factors, the ratio of the elderly to the working force population. And one could start to make adjustments to this defined contribution that the government is making toward your Medicare premium payments based on the same demographic shifts that are going to be made in the pension world. Now, Believe me, I, I know how hard it would be to do this. It's a, it's a leap of, it would be such a leap of uh, policy here in the United States, it's hard to imagine. But at least some of the thought process might actually be created, lead to some creative thinking. Um, you know, certainly I've been a longtime supporter of moving toward a defined contribution model in Medicare anyway. The idea is to foster more competition and, and choice among the beneficiary population that could then put cost pressure back on the delivery system of healthcare. That's its value in and separate and apart from it, what it might do in, in terms of this kind of a discussion we're having today. Um, but you could, as I just said, 
adjust those defined contributions based on when someone starts to take them. So perhaps you have a calculation that says, here's how much Medicare premium payments you can get from the government over your lifetime. If you take it at age 70, you can get more. And if you take it at age 65, you get a little bit less. So again, another encouragement to work longer instead of taking your Medicare benefits perhaps before you really need it. I think it also lends itself, when you move into a defined contribution uh, uh, structure, it would lend itself to much more means and income testing than today's current benefit. Right now what they're trying to do is keep adding on premium requirements on top of the, um, uh, uh, the requirements, depending on if your income exceeds a certain threshold. Uh, you know, if someone is, if you start to think about Medicare as real value in the fact that, hey, you're going to get this insurance, the question now is only who's going to pay for it. Um, for people that are well-to-do and have plenty of retirement savings, they can then start to have in their mind, I have to, I'm going to have insurance, it's government guaranteed insurance when I reach 65 or 70, but I'm paying the premium myself, okay? That's still hugely valuable to that person, and it doesn't necessarily require that they get any transfer payment from the government. And so if you do it that way, you start to realize you don't necessarily need to give a Medicare payment to people making, you know, any money above, you know, uh, a certain threshold. Uh, I'm going to have one more comment, which is going back on, on uh, back to, to sort of some, some of the things Edward said, uh, which I think is exactly right, which is that, um, you know, to make all of this work in the United States, we probably do need, and as I mentioned earlier, we probably do need to start thinking about raising the SSI benefit, one way to think about it is to provide a more generous benefit to the, to the old, to the very old. And instead of raising the SSI benefits threshold for everybody, why not say, we're going to have an, an even higher standard for people that are age 80 and older. And, you know, uh, if somebody outlives their savings, their family members die, there's all kinds of reasons why a person 80 and older is far more, even more vulnerable than an elderly person at 65. And you might be able to, I think, uh, get a, a bigger consensus around that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, before I turn to the audience, let me ask uh, several questions of the panelists. Um, to me, the most interesting thing about the foreign reforms is that they did them. Uh, that is, they overcame <laughs> very serious political obstacles. Frankly, looking at the United States, the political situation really looks grim to me right now. Uh, even talking to some of the Tea Party types who are very keen on reducing spending and the size of government, they get very nervous when you start talking about Social Security reform or, or Medicare reform. Um, so I've sort of drawn the reluctant conclusion that we're not going to get anywhere unless we face some sort of crisis. Um, now, it seems to me, Richard, that in some of the countries that you talked about, uh, there were indeed crises. I mean, in Sweden, early in the 1990s, very serious economic and financial difficulties. In Canada, certainly on the verge of crisis, if not actually in one. I think Australia had a foreign exchange crisis. Um, I wonder, what's your notion of, of how, how those crises related to the subsequent Social Security reforms? Right. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's probably true um, that in a fair number, maybe even the majority uh, of, of other developed countries that have undertaken a significant reform of, of public pension systems, that th this was done in response to, to a crisis of one kind or another. Um, I mean, in, in Italy, it it wasn't coincidental, coincidental that, that the pension reforms, uh, and, and Edward, correct me if I, if I get any of this wrong, um, um, you know, coincided with the need uh, to show that their, their, their government books were in reasonable order. Uh, uh, th th this, this was right in the, in the run up to, to joining the, the, the EMU, the, the, the Monetary Union. Um, as Rudy mentioned, uh, uh, a cr crisis in Sweden. Germany reformed its uh, pension system, you know, back when it was the sick man of Europe. Um, and along with pension reform, there were a whole series of labor market reforms. Um, uh, cer certainly throughout Central and Eastern Europe, the, the reforms coincided with the, uh, 
uh, uh, the, tra the transition from uh, you know command and control to market economies. Um, so I, 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 I think that that's I think that that's right, and and I think it um, certainly will. I, I say this reluctantly too, but but probably very probably require a major crisis uh, in the United States to get significant reform. And, and if you think back, you know, through, through history, um, you know, you got, you got Social Security itself during the, uh, you know, as part of the New Deal. Um, when you have, when, when, when like, like Rob Emanuel said, not, not you know, I, I don't often quote Rob Emanuel, but a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. This last one was wasted. Um, so I guess we need a new one. Um, the Great Depression, you know, gave rise to the New Deal. Social Security was part of that. The, the stagflation, right, of, of the late 70s and early 80s, around, this is not entitlement reform, but around, allowed Ro Ronald Reagan, the Reagan administration, to push through its deregulation agenda. So you, 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 you may well need a, uh, a, significant, a significant crisis. You mentioned Italy. A few years ago, I was visited by a deputy minister of finance who was in charge of their social security system. And I mentioned to her that I had heard it was hard collecting payroll taxes in Italy, especially in the south of Italy. And she said, yes, that was true, but it didn't present a problem because their offices were so inefficient they didn't pay benefits either. Uh, so that, that, that is one approach to reform. Uh, um, but one thing we don't talk a lot about in the United States is just administering the system, and I think that's because, at least with Social Security, uh, we really do administer it quite well at low cost. Uh, you can argue about Medicare a little more, uh, but I was wondering, Ed, uh, how you saw administration across countries, and you've worked a lot in emerging uh, economies. I mean, are, are these systems really workable in a, in a poor country? Goodness, that's a, that's a, that's, that's a very, big, very big question. Um, just, just, go, uh, just return to the, to the, to the sort of crisis issue. I think um, um, clearly the, the recent crisis has produced a, a, an acceleration in pension reform, um, and, and most countries have not wasted this, this, this um, um, good, good opportunity. Um, the, I think the, the alarming thing, though, is if you do wait until a crisis, then the adjustment is ever more painful. And we've seen Greece and Italy, for example, um, have had, had to undertake pension reforms very fast and um, very painful changes. The pension age for women who work in the public sector in Italy went from 60 to 67 o o overnight almost. And so incredibly painful reforms um, because they had kept de um, delaying it. And, and, and the same is true of, of, of Greece as, as well. Up from 45 as recently as uh, the early 90s, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Um, in terms of um, what's what's happening in in um, emerging markets, uh, the, um, the the defined contribution model has has been taken up quite widely now in, in Latin America and in um, in Eastern Europe, and also now um, some countries in Africa as well. In um, Nigeria, for example, um, there is a there is a compulsory defined contribution plan. What um, has happened um, is that the coverage of formal pension systems remains very strongly related to, to national income per head. And so the poorest countries in Africa and, um, and in South Asia probably cover roughly 5% of their workforces. And so I think the implicit in your question was, is there much point in, in, in just covering 5% of the workforce. What, what is the point of having the, all of the um, administration and so on for, for these schemes which are very, 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 very small? Um, um, then there's a whole series of countries with roughly half of the workforce covered. That would be, would be true of most of Latin America and so on, with a few, with a few um, um, less than that. At that point, it does seem sensible to have some sort of um, um, formal pension arrangement in place. I just wanted to come back as well um, briefly on the, on the 
um, the issue of these automatic um, stabilization mechanisms. I think it is very interesting to note that in Sweden, when the crisis came, they just re changed all the rules um, because it, they would have had to cut benefits by 4% in one year, and they just said, no, that's politically impossible. So you have to be, have some care. If you're cutting people's benefits, it's however you dress it up, you're still cutting the money, and, it, and that's politically difficult. In Germany, in five of the six years since the new rule came in, they have ignored it. So they, they have put in larger increases than their rules said for five of the six years. So you do have to be very careful with these mechanisms that you don't kid yourself that you've, you've made everything safe and sustainable and, and nothing can go wrong because the politics still, still enters into it and can still um, make difficult decisions even more difficult. Uh, Jim, in the context of Medicare, We've seen this remarkable slowdown in the rate of growth of spending that's lasted a number of years now. Uh, do you expect that to continue? Uh, you know what causes it? Well, uh, there is no definitive answer to what's going on in the health system, but the, uh, the team of people that do the, the, the Medicare numbers and the national health account numbers um, fr from the executive branch uh, every year, the actuaries, did a paper last fall that you know will be updated again this September, and so we can see what they say this year. But when they looked at the the experience in the recent years, they basically attributed the vast majority of the downward pressure that's been the downward movement in the in the spending growth rate to the uh, economic conditions in the country, the recession itself, and then the uh, aftermath, the slow recovery. And they did a, a series of simulations going back in time. Uh, to all the you know spending patterns over the last uh, several decades, and said that the pat the rough pattern of what has occurred in recent years follows pretty closely with what you would have expected from what had happened in previous uh, slowdowns. Uh, moreover, the downward trend that one sees in health spending here in the United States can be found in many many parts of the world, where of course the the crisis, the global financial crisis, was a global phenomenon, and so. There was depressed demand uh, for health services, not just here in the United States, but elsewhere, which sort of gives you a sense that there wasn't necessarily something unique going on here in the United States. Uh, the second point to make, though, is that there is slightly detectable a longer-term trend in the United States toward uh, uh, spending decline, even apart from the um, downturn. And the actuaries admit as much, but they don't attribute it. It's so small relative to the other thing. They don't. They don't make a big deal of it yet, but we'll see what happens. But if, if there's anything going on structurally, the most likely culprit, I think, by universal, by, by people that are in the system and watching what's been going on, is the movement toward higher deductibles, uh, especially in employer plans, going back to about 2004 and five. And so there's been a pretty steady, heavy push by employers of their workforces into higher deductible plans. And that has perhaps put some moderation on, on the spending growth, not just in the, the employer system, but also throughout the whole system, including in Medicare. Some people think there's, some people think there's a movement away from fee-for-service medicine that's so inefficient. Do you see any importance of that? There's been an upward trend in Medicare in the uh, part of the program that is privately administered called Medicare Advantage, and that's much more sizable than it was a decade ago. It's now about 25%, 27% of the program, and new entrants are going into it at about a rate of one out of two. So yeah, that's potentially an issue, a, a thing that's going on there, um, but uh, that's not the, that, that, that has uh, nothing to do with, you know, there's been a big debate about whether things that have been enacted in the health care law in 2010 have caused this, and that trend has predates that law by a, a long time, and also, if anything, th that law will reverse that trend to some degree. And so it would be hard to attribute that to things that have happened to try to move away from fee-for-service from the 2010 law. Well, let me turn to the audience. Uh, questions? Yes, way at the back there. Thank you. I'm Stephen Kanna, retired from the U.S. Council for International Business. And we, you've, you've used the word cuts a lot. And are we talking about cuts in the rate of increase, or are we talking about absolute cuts? And shouldn't we start changing the dialogue when, when we try to, uh, the ideas were floated about uh, amending the inflation rate? 
adjustment for Social Security. The press talked about they're cutting Social Security. They weren't cutting Social Security. You're cutting the rate of increase. So if you change the dialogue a little bit, could this help also? Well, I'm, I'm, while I'm sympathetic to your, to your, to your, to your argument, um, you know, when we're, when, when, when we're talking about projections, um, you know, over a 10, 20, 30 year period, um, um, it, 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 it really only makes sense, you know, to talk about benefits relative to wages or, 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 or relative to, to GDP. Um, um, it, it, yes, we're, 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 we're reducing the, the projected growth um, 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 in, 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 in benefits, but if, if your point is that so long as we're paying the same nominal dollar benefit in 2030 that we're paying today, we haven't cut it, I, I think that, that, that that's you know, economically silly to, to, to say that. Absolute nom absolute real dollar cuts. Jim? <laughs> I think the answer I think the answer the answer is basically yes. Uh, in, in the Medicare context, if we had Medicare growing at at uh, at essentially inflation, consumer inflation, uh, maybe even plus a little bit but in below GDP growth and certainly below the historical rate of growth in health spending, absolutely that would solve the problem. Getting there, though, uh, will still be very painful. You know, you won't be able to fool the public because it will still be quite painful because, you know, the, the, they'll notice that there's a slowdown in their use of services and new technology and the quality will feel different. So it's not, it's not something that one can slip by people without. I mean, there, there's a reason why some of it bad. There's been a reason why some of these things have been growing faster than uh, a, a normal rate because there's huge demand for, um, especially in the health world, health benefits. So uh, you can do it. That would solve the problem. I think some semantics can help here, but I, 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 I've been around the debate long enough to know that it doesn't get you all the way there. You know, at some point, you're, you're, you you got to bite the bullet. Jane. Oh, just a quick, a quick um, um, comment on that. Um, the uh, he's, no, he's left. So <laughs> anyway, but I will still make a quick, quick comment. Um, uh, currently, in 2010, roughly speaking, the uh, European countries on average spent about nine percent of GDP on pensions. If demographics alone um, were to happen, that would double to 18 percent by 2060. The actual projections are more like 12. So, so. It's going up, but there have, it, but there have been cuts. Um, you, you can have both of the things going on at the same time. And the, um, the way I think of a cut is uh, what was promised to, you know, what was promised to my parents, what, what benefit was promised to them, what's promised to me, and how much smaller that is. That, to me, is a, is a, is a, is a cut. Um, um, it, and it's, and it, they, they are significant. Jane? Uh, Gene Sterling, the Urban Institute. Uh, sometimes I think that uh, people like us in this room are major culprits in this problem in the sense that uh, across both these countries, the primary issue that causes the imbalances is a labor force problem, and it's not really a financial problem. And it, we're all trained in finances, so we all try to manipulate them numbers and change present values and get trust funds and balance and, and try to find financial solutions to this, whether tax rate increases or benefit cuts. And when we do that, I wonder if we don't miss out on, on the labor force, broader labor force issues, so that in point of fact, one of the biggest impacts of these of this demographics isn't on Social Security at all. It's on lower growth rates, lower GDP, lower personal income, lower income tax collections, on and on. And Social Security is just a piece of the puzzle. Social Security and Medicare define some of that larger issue because they define when we're old. So people like Rudy are now very old, and Richard and Jim are, are almost old because we define old as being 62. 
uh, and that sets all sorts of signals for the economy even beyond the incentive. So the, cur the question, maybe it's mainly for you, Edward, but is to what extent did countries formally actually think about the labor force issue so that when they do things like benefit cuts, thought about doing more benefit cuts in young age or younger old ages, say 62 to 70 versus older than 70, to what extent did they, you know, in the United States, think about early retirement ages uh, where the impact I think the early retirement age has little effect on Social Security. We could have a big impact on the rest of, of the budget and on personal income, so on and so forth. So I'm curious the extent to which these countries really formally are addressing or did address the l broader labor force issue of which Social Security is only a piece. Um, I, I, do, I do agree with you there. And you, you have to think of, 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 the, um, of policy as being both um, on the demand side and on the supply side. And so it, it's no use designing a, a beautiful pension system with all the right incentives to keep working in it if there aren't any jobs for, for, for older people to, to have. Um, I think what, what has been happening is that the, the age, the average age of the workforce has been going up. And I think um, the, the low point was 1966, when I think the average age of the workforce was roughly about 32 or something. It's already got to 40. And so employers are having to adjust to a reality, which is that if you want to have any workers at all, you are going to have to have some older workers because there, there aren't enough sort of bodies in the, in the, um, in the economy. Um, I think countries have, to a large extent, tried to look at this problem holistically. So you have had um, tightening up of, of the rules for early retirement and so on. And in some cases, Germany would be a, a very good example, there has been a dr dramatic change in behavior that people are retiring significantly later than, than, than they used to do. I think um, um, much of the problems of pensions are answered, are, can be answered in one number, which is 70. If everyone could be persuaded to work till they were 70, then all of these problems would disappear. And we could have quite sizable incomes in our retirement, as long as our retirement was roughly what it used to be in the 1960s, when people actually retired um, later than they do today. It was the, the average retirement age in France in the 1960s was actually above 65. Um, it's now 58. Um, so if, if, we, if we move back to a situation in the 60s where you could poss possibly be expected to live about 10 years in retirement, instead of one where you live 20 years in retirement, you could fix much, much of the problem. Uh, se 70 seems almost teenage to me, but Richard, I see you, uh, you put up uh, a chart. Yeah, I, I put up a chart that I, that I hadn't, hadn't shown before, um, um, which, which is, is related, I think, to the point that, that, that Gene's making. Um, you know, vast, this is sort of borrowing the way you've, you've talked about it, Gene, but you know, vast rivers of, of, of public money pension money, but other benefits too, uh, 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 flow um, in, in, in every developed country, you know, to adults in their 60s uh, in, uh, who are increasingly not really elderly at all, but, but, but late middle-aged. And I, I've sometimes been criticized, the, this age 60 threshold, and, and a lot of these numbers come from my Global Aging Preparedness Index, you know, why age 60? Well, I mean, it's not meant to, to indicate, you know, the threshold of, of, of you know, functional senescence. Uh, hope, hope not. Uh, we are getting pretty close, aren't we, Jim? Um, but, uh, but, but it is pretty close to the effect of retirement age in, 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 most, in most developed countries. And in the United States, roughly a third of cash benefits to the, you know, elderly defined as adults 60 and over flow to people in their 60s. And um, 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 in some countries, it's, uh, it's significantly more than, 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 than that. So I think, I think a big part of the solution, and, and this is you know, e echoing something I think you were saying, Jim, is to you know, shift benefits more towards true old age when, I mean, if the solution, if part of the solution is to work longer, right, and to save more, well, th there's a point beyond which work becomes less feasible for most people. Maybe for some people that's already in the 60s, for many more people it's in, it's in the 70s. So, you know, the, the, the older elderly, and here I draw the threshold at 70 rather than 80, um, but, but they're, they're, they're less able to, to, to work. They're at increasing risk of running out of their savings. Um, and they have, uh, in, in large part, because they don't work as much, they have much lower 
uh, per capita income in most countries than uh, the younger elderly do. So, so, so to looking, lo looking, looking toward the future, I, I, I think we might begin to think about the role of the government more as a, you know, rather than one of these, these three legs in this, you know, this mythical or the, 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 this much talked about stool, really as a, as a kind of backstop um, against, you know, the risk of inability to work and, 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 and longevity risk and the risk of uh, running out of savings in, in what's true old age. Anyway. Uh, Sandy? Well, that brought up a lot of hands. <laughs> Sandy? Yeah. Um, Richard, would you mind putting up that chart? Sorry. Would you mind putting up that chart you showed of the effect of reform on, mm -hmm. I think it's average pensions? That's, let's see, that's it, yeah. Um, sorry, could, could, could you give a rough explanation or a, or a general explanation of why the U.S. is expected to decline by one-fifth even? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Part of that's the increase in the Social Security retirement age uh, to 67, uh, which is not actually a retirement age increase at all, but a pro rata benefit cut uh, at each age. Um, but, and, and I, I, I don't have the, I, I can't parse it for you exactly. That, that might be half of it. Um, the, the, the other part, in my public, in my, in, 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 in my gap index definition uh, of public old age benefits, we include civil service pensions. So embedded in there is also uh, uh, the shift from the old CSRS system to the new and less generous FERS system. Um, so those would be the two, the two main re reasons. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Something else. Roman Zaitek, can I have the follow-up on the same question? I missed oh, two questions related to this one. Um, these are future projections. How much of this stuff has already occurred? That's the most fundamental one. Because my experience in many countries, with many countries that I worked on, and that includes some of the Baltic states or Poland or Hungary, is that they implemented reforms, very ambitious reforms, and it was obvious from the beginning that they were unsustainable and they were just reversed, like it happened in Hungary or Poland. The Baltics, by the way, I think the securities were, uh, most of the pension money is invested in, in treasury securities. And then what is the offset? You know, so yeah, we reduce it on the pension expenditure, but then if pensions will decline too much compared to median salary, there's going to be you know, demands, public demands, which will be most likely accommodated from, from other parts of the budget. Ab ab absolutely. Um, you know, to, and I, I, I think I alluded uh, at least to this point in my talk, or maybe I skipped it over to, to, to try not to slop over the, the time limit too much. Um, but, but yeah, you, I mean, you have to take some of this with a grain of salt. Um, when I constructed my Global Aging Preparedness Index, I felt reluctantly, but I felt obliged to use current law uh, uh, projections. You know, in the case of Italy, well, I love Italy. I did my doctoral research there. Um, but, but, you know, in the case of Italy, I sometimes say that they've solved the projections, not the problem. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, th th there, there is a real question whether uh, uh, these reforms are, are, are socially uh, uh, and, and politically sustainable because, now, it, Part, part, of, part of these, these, these large decli declines in, 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 in benefits, you know, in, under current law relative to the current deal are due to higher reti assumed retirement ages in some countries, but a big part of it, you know, in Germany, Italy, and a number of other countries is actually, you know, the pr pr projected current law cuts in benefits relative to wages. Now, is that going to happen? Well, in the gap index, we have a, a sort of total household income model. We take into account uh, trends in labor force participation um, and also funded pension savings, and we at least try to look at um, whether countries are are filling in that gap or not. Um, and in our pr pr projections, it kind of looks like Germany and Sweden are. Uh, it doesn't look like France and Italy are at all. So yeah, there, there's 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 a very big question. Um, about whether current law pension projections uh, in, in a lot of EU countries, in my opinion, 
um, actually describe uh, uh, the, the most likely future course for spending. Uh, because the, the, the cuts are prospective, right? And I mean, it, in Italy, you know, to, to come back to Italy again, when they enacted the, uh, the Dini reform, you know, the one that shifted to the NDC system, back in the mid-90s, they grandfathered everybody old enough to vote, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, in the face of, in the face of, and, and remember the chart I showed so, somewhere in here on the, the, um, the high level of dependence on public benefits, right? High level of dependence on public benefits and an aging electorate, um, you need to be, it, let me just sum it up this way and then I'll stop. It, we, you, you, you cannot have an adequate pension system that's fiscally unsustainable, right, because the thing crashes. In, in, in the end, you may not be able, be, be able to have a fiscally sustainable system that's inadequate because of precisely what you said. You're going to get pushback from the electorate, and rightly so, right? Um, it, ha it has to be both sustainable and, and, and adequate. I could just say I, I would like to say say just something about this. <clears throat> My impression from from reading about and, and watching what's happened around the world is that it's sort of the opposite of what would happen here in the United States. Is that <clears throat> the the amount of sound and fury that goes around the enactment of something is quite remarkable. In other words, if someone were to propose a very sweeping Social Security reform, it cannot secretly and quietly be enacted. Okay, you can't slip it through the system. Okay, there will be an immense political debate around it, and a lot of gnashing of teeth, and a lot of people probably lose their seats over it. Okay, so having gone through the turmoil of doing something like that, it it's very difficult to reverse later. Actually, uh, that think of the 1983 reforms. Um, you know, they enacted a, a, a upward shift in the retirement age, and it's been going ongoing now for the last decade or so, and hardly anybody says anything about it. It's cutting people's benefits right now, and nothing much is being said. So I, I, I think one thing I've learned from reading about these other countries is when they enacted these things, often in a parliamentary system, the amount of discussion and debate about what was actually happening was incredibly minimal. It was pretty opaque, and the sweeping reforms that were enacted sometimes were hardly understood by the public at the time they were being enacted. So. I think it's, you know, it depends a little bit on context. And, you know, every country is different, but I, I would just say that about what I've been reading. Yeah, by that standard, we did it pretty well because yeah. uh, those of us old enough to remember uh, the increase in the normal age was slipped in at the last minute, as it were, and done on the floor of the House. And I've seen polls that suggest that less than a majority of the population even realizes it's going on today. Yes, put in the front yard. yard. Question. Uh, question. I'm just one just brief comment about what you said is that with Social Security, I think you're very correct. But if you look at, say, Medicare and the sustainable growth rate sort of kabuki that goes on every year where Congress postpones it, you know, every single year for going on almost, I think, a decade now. Uh, perhaps we are not as doing quite as well as, as might otherwise be indicated. My question, though, is sort of what is to be done? That uh, I think that this uh, presentation has done a very good job of laying out the, the sort of issues. But other than waiting for our creditors to start calling in their their debts, sort of is there any lessons that can are there any lessons that can be drawn from the various reforms in various countries as to sort of a path forward? What is the best way to go about doing this in a way that? is politically sustainable, both in the sense of getting it passed and in not playing games with it once it's been passed? <laughs> well, I do think that, uh, that um, first of all, I think we're probably in a, in a window of about uh, 10 years or so when, when something will happen. You know, it's, it's hard to tell exactly what will precipitate it, but if you just look at the CBO projections and the interest payments on the debt and, and the the pressure, the amount of funding that taxpayers are putting forward just to pay interest on the debt and to cover um, entitlement obligations. Meanwhile, we're planning this massive downscaling of our uh, national security spending. Something's going to give, uh, you know, now. Having said that, what, what, what would then happen? I mean, I think you would, you would pursue a series of incremental steps in the basic same direction 
that other countries have gone. As I, the themes are still the same. Try to build into the programs something that recognizes changing demographics. Uh, build in a little bit of automatic control if you can. And emphasize longer working lives and fully funded retirement benefits. And perhaps in the United States context, a better safety net. I mean, I think if you pursue those, you can downsize unfunded liability commitments, but in a way that is prospective. Um, anyway, that's, that would be how I would think about it. Um, sorry, just a very, very quick observation. Is, my understanding is that there is a sort of automatic thing in Social Security that when the reserve fund is exhausted, that, that in theory, aren't all benefits supposed to be cut by 20%? Are, am I missing something here? In theory, in theory, it's never been tested in the courts, yeah. right? So it's a, it's a reading of the statute that says if you, the trust fund, is fully depleted, you'd have an automatic across-the-board cut in benefits. No administration has tested that. No court has looked at it. No one knows what would happen. And it was the threat of that that triggered the 1983 reform. Yes. I'm old enough. Mauricio Soto from the IMF. So just one quick remark is when you, know, when you go to other countries, especially in Europe, they actually look to the U.S. and say, how could we do that? Small system, streamlined, low taxes, relatively speaking, and the problem, the fiscal problem, is not that dramatic as it used to be in Europe. And uh, my, my, my question, my question is, is related more, how does it all fit together? I mean, we're proposing here longer work lives, different types of benefit cuts. We can call it increases in retirement age, rep lower replacement rates, better accrual rates. So uh, as somebody mentioned here that maybe going back to the 1960s, I think it did, meaning people are going to retire maybe at their 70s. If we move to Europe, average payroll tax rates for pensions are close to 20 or probably higher than 20% of wages. Is there a point that we will reach a breaking point for the social contract? Will young people pay 20% for 45 years to get a relatively low pension? And, and that's, that's something I all, all struggle with. Would that happen? At what point does the social contract break down? Well, I don't know. Maybe there's an analogy in, you know, to financial markets. Um, you know, there's 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 some uh, debt level at which, uh, you know, one one thing we know. There are two things we know, and one of them is that there's some debt level at which you know, uh, 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 funding will not be forthcoming uh, at affordable or attractive interest rates. And the other thing is that we can't know <laughs> what that threshold is. And, and I think that's probably true with the social contract, too. Um, you know, there, there have been people uh, uh, over, over, over the years who've, who've tried to argue that, you know, a, a higher tax rate will actually not be overburdening younger generations in the future because they'll be so much more affluent um, that they could afford to pay 20 or even 30 percent of their wages and taxes and still have a higher uh, uh, real income than, than, than people do today. I, I, don't, I don't think that that, that, that argument really really hold, hold, holds up holds up very well, you know, on, on either political or moral grounds. Essentially what it amounts to, 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 to saying is that it's okay, you know, to confiscate our children's economic progress so long as we leave them a little, little bit better off than, than, than we are today. I, I, th I think there is a point, um, but, but I, don't, I don't know what that point is. It's probably a hell, hell of a lot lower in the United States uh, yeah. than, it is in, uh, than it is in France, where, where the actual, you know, payroll tax rate you know, if you include the, the, the employer share, you know, as any good economist would, is really what, Edward, about 40%? 46. Percent? Hmm? 46. 46%. Percent. That's, for, that's for all social benefits. For all social benefits. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, 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 yeah, 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 that's the scariest right. one is Italy, where it's 33% just for pensions, and then there's other bits on top of that. And the average for all the OECD countries is 20 um, um, roughly, and, and, and uh, slightly more on employers than on, on employees, but the average is, is 20 for pensions alone. Let, let, let me just throw in one, one more related, related point. Uh, uh, you're mentioning Italy kind of triggered this, this line of thinking. I, I think it makes a difference 
wh whether a welfare state has a large investment component or not. I mean, a country like Italy uh, uh, or Japan uh, or, or the United States is essentially, you know, we have a welfare state for old people. Um, you know, per, capita, per capita benefits, especially at the federal level, but, but, but indeed at all levels of government, uh, are, are highly skewed. Benefit spending is highly skewed to the elderly. That's true in Italy, too. Um, um, you know, it, it, it all goes to, 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 to pensions. They hardly have unemployment insurance. They don't have family benefits. If you have a wealth, if you're going to spend 40 or 50 percent of GDP, you know, for God's like, like, you know, for God's sakes, have an investment component in your welfare state um, where, where, you're, where you're investing. That wouldn't be my choice, okay? I, I mean, you know, I, I'm not advocating. A, a hugely larger public sector, but if you're going to have one, make sure it has an investment component. And then I think you'll get less, less, less pushback. But if the redistribution is all intergenerational, right? Can I? Uh, yeah. yeah. Very quick point on, on Italy. Strangely enough, we, I collected statistics on how age biased is voting. So what are voter turnout rates for, for older people and what are voter turnout rates for younger people? Italy is the only country where more younger people vote than older people, yet it has the most age-biased welfare state. In contrast, my own country, the UK, has the, mo mo the most age-biased electorate, far more so than the U United States, and has a very unage-biased welfare state. So, so th these things can go in, very, in, in, in quite strange directions. Uh, can I, I just want to make a comment about the, the question. and in the background of all of this, and in a little bit of the background of your question is, of course, we have the aging of the population, but really what's driving most of this is the plummeting fertility rates, right? I mean, you, there's, there is no solution to no workforce, future workforce. I mean, the, the famous Conrad Adenauer thing about, you know, building post-war Germany's welfare state was, well, we can afford this because we're all, Germans will always have babies. You know, that was sort of the, the thought. And 25 years later, Germans stopped having babies, basically. And um, really, the, the, the truth is that you cannot have a pay-as-you-go structure, social contract built around pay-as-you-go, uh, financed through pen, you know, uh, 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 payroll taxes, essentially, <laughs> if the, if the below-level replacement rate, and it's well below in many, many countries. Not just, it's not just a smidgen low, right? It's well, well below. That's catastrophic eventually just is. The question is, how does the dislocation occur? And you're right. I mean, it's a slow motion thing. And so in some ways, I commend these other countries for dealing prospectively with their massive pension issues. But they've done it in a way that hasn't, you know, you still have not solved the fundamental issue remains. If you depopulate your workforce, who's going to pay for this? And uh, there is, you know, I've reached the conclusion to there is no solution to that. It's, it's just large dislocation for that country. Can I slightly disagree with you there? That, um, um, there are significant differences between OECD countries in, in the fertility yes. rate. And some countries, um, examples would be the UK, France, and Sweden, have reversed long-term secular declines. And they're getting close to, I think it's 1.96 is the latest number for the UK, and similar for France and Sweden. So it's gone down to 1.7. It's come back to close to replacement. In Germany, it is extremely low. In Japan, it is extremely low. In, if we look at um, back in the 1960s, the proportion of women in work was positively related, sorry, negatively related to the number of children they had. So it was stay-at-home mums, they made more babies. Now the reverse is true. And so countries which make it possible for you to combine working and having children, both have more workers and have more children. And that would be France, Sweden, the UK. And you can see in Germany, because school finishes at 3 o'clock and they don't give children school lunches, it's very difficult for women to have children and work. And in Japan, it's just social anathema for, for, um, for women to, to have children and work. So, and they work too long hours anyway. So you end up in those countries, fewer workers and fewer babies compared with other countries. So if, if Germany, Japan, Korea, allowed women to combine working and, and having babies, I think they would have more of both. And so, that, so there are some differences out there, and slightly more positive than, than you. Absolutely, ab, 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 absolutely correct. Um. Question in the back. Yes, Eric Lechica from US Medicare in the Philippines. 
Uh, some, some of my colleagues from Europe have explained that they have a policy of portability uh, of benefits um, that, for example, in Europe, I just, I just want to get confirmation uh, on this, is that they are providing incentives for uh, Germans and French to retire in uh, uh, third world countries to save on the costs of retirement, caregiving, uh, examples in the Philippines, that the Philippines was chosen by the EU uh, folks to send many of their uh, elderly who choose to retire overseas. And I've been to several of those retirement villages. Also in Japan has been opening retirement uh, villages subsidized by the hospital chains. Is that one way of reducing the cost of the, the aging population of the industrialized countries by encouraging those migration of their elderly? Just like here in the, in the U.S., many retire in Mexico just to uh, save on. I, I don't think you would get to a situation where that could you would be able to export sufficiently large numbers of elderly for it to make a meaningful difference. I mean, you know, the Philippines would just be full of retired Europeans. Um, there are population of the EU is about 350 million, so say roughly 50 million retirees. You can't shift, you know, it's physically impossible to shift anything that's going to make a, make a meaning, meaningful difference to that. Um, and I think um, probably more likely is that what will continue to go on is that we'll import lots of people from the Philippines to look after our old people, which, um, which is effectively what we do today. There are very few British people who work in um, nursing homes and so on.